mind bend. Non ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness for a mind bend creative. Rod Benson, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You drove over here today on a beautiful motorized bicycle. I did. It's part of an experiment. It's part of an experiment and a lifestyle. Whereas I am taking public transit until my new car gets in, which currently the last update said January. So could be six months of me on a bicycle and a uh, series of buses and trains that has so far been very interesting. Yeah, the train, how does the train work in Los Angeles? Is the train working for you in Los Angeles? Is it, are you utilizing it? <laughs> is it utilizable? I'll say this, the train is very reliable. The buses are less so. So anytime I know I have to deal with a bus, potentially, I got to add at least 30 minutes. Mm. I might get there early. I might still get there late. I might show up sweaty. If it's just the train and the bicycle, it's, it's as fast as can be. When you sit on the, on the bus, do you talk to anybody or are you just listening to music and getting where you need to go? I don't talk to anybody in public, really. And that is mostly due to being so tall that everyone wants to talk to me only about that every given moment of the day. So I actually, you know, I wrote a, a, an article about this, but I always have headphones on when I'm outside. Yeah. Always. And usually big ones to distract people, like the same way women wear them. I mean, obviously without the, the danger implications, but the idea is that I don't want to have a random conversation with you about the exact same thing, which is that I am tall. Mm hmm. And that leads us to being tall helped you to be a professional basketball player. That and <laughs> athleticism and you know, years and years and years. You have to, it's not just the tall. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not just, just the, tall. the tall. Yeah. So um, do you get to play basketball now for fun ever? Do you take time to do it or is it something you try to stay away from? Uh, I probably haven't touched the ball in three or four years. Wow. Um, I don't miss it at all. I don't think about it really at all. I mean, there's parts of me that still, you know, if I'm, board or something you might catch me doing you know some air free throws or something but reflexive that's that's it yeah. that's it you also catch me doing air golf swings probably mm -hmm. four times as often mm -hmm. i golf a lot i play basketball zero i talk about basketball sometimes yeah but even when i was playing and people asked me did i play i'd always say no because mm. the answers never satiate somebody unless you're lebron james or kobe or something the answers don't please people they don't about basketball yeah about the don't. life it, it, as a sample, ask me, do you play basketball? Do you play basketball? Yes. What is your natural follow-up question? Is it cool? I See, uh, there's no answer I could give there that would be satisfying, but that's not the, <laughs> that's not the usual yeah, okay, second question. I would question. say, uh, um, um, who did you play for? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a complicated thing. Yeah. Because I was in the NBA for like six total weeks. The rest of my time were on random overseas teams. So if I say the NBA version... People generally are like, oh, why didn't you only six weeks? Why? Like the oh, question God. why, like a five-year-old yeah, keeps why? coming. And yeah. if it's overseas, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, I know a guy overseas. And it's immediately super reductive also. Ugh. Because not overseas is not overseas, right? There's a burger from, you know, burgers never say die, and then there's three-day-old McDonald's. But everyone lumps it all together. Mm -hmm. And I would say more people playing overseas are more braggadocious mm -hmm. than people playing over here because people don't understand it. So, you know, someone who's really not very good but has like a kind of live, work, play situation in Denmark or some country that doesn't have good basketball. Oh, not good overall. They're not, yeah, they don't they're have not good at the game, yeah. but yeah. they'll come back and be like, yeah, I play. Like me and him are the same. Uh -huh. So it leads me like I have to protect my own skills too. So it's just never – it's never that fun for even the person listening. Yeah, And it's certainly not fun for me because also – I have to talk about this involuntarily, like every day, multiple yes. times, yes. multiple times. So I found the easiest thing is just to say no, and that leads to one follow up, <laughs> one follow up statement. Like, if I had your height, man, I'd be. <laughs> no. Everybody knows what to do for you better than you do. They don't. And these people don't even know what to do with themselves, yeah, right? Like, sure. if we if we are at, <laughs> yeah, if we are on the train and you don't have shoes on, don't talk to me about <laughs> what I should have done. Yeah. You should have put some shoes on today. The yeah. train is disgusting. Let me ask one more basketball <laughs> question, though. Did your family uh, worry about you going overseas so much? Uh, no. It never really came up like that. I'm not that close with my immediate family either, uh, save for my brother. And he he wanted to come visit. 
Uh, he stayed with me in Korea for, you know, months and months and did some modeling and stuff out there, but no one had concerns. Where's your family at? Uh, mostly in San Diego. Is that where you grew up, San Diego? L.A. and San Diego. L.A. and San Diego. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How do you think growing up in Los Angeles affects a person differently than uh, somebody who grows up in a, in a entirely different part of the country? What's 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 unique about here, you think? I'll give an answer no one expects, but I firmly believe having been to 47 of the states and 40 countries, L.A. is the most diverse of all of them. It's one of the few places where the, the place that you start and the place that you end have a similar diversity. Mm. Um, and... and the in between as well. So I'll give an example like New York. People think New York is very diverse because mm -hmm. it is numbers wise. But most people I know in New York, they live in Chelsea around a bunch of white people. And then they get an Uber to a party in Soho and see or Bushwick and see the exact same people. Uh, there's so many rooms there where it's mostly one thing or the other. Mm. Most of my time in L.A. is very di is is such in such a diverse space you know, people think Californians, but especially people from L.A. are very like loosey goosey, like go with the flow because it's there's a beach nearby. I think it's because we've been so socially conditioned to so many different things mm. that it, we're not shocked. We're not it, our system doesn't get overloaded by things just because we don't understand them, because generally we do. The system doesn't get overloaded because you generally understand things. Yeah. Like if you go to therapy at all. A big part of therapy, if you're dealing with any sort of trauma, is that you dive into that trauma, you understand it, and therefore when something triggers that again, you don't have the same reaction, especially if you're dealing with temper issues, right? So if I get mad every time someone says cheeseburger, I force myself to think about cheeseburger until it doesn't trigger that in me anymore. Some version of that comes with living in L.A. in general. Uh, you're, you're less triggered by yeah. those things. Yeah. And the part of L.A. that people usually describe where it, it um, goes against what I just said mm -hmm. are all the transplants. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you, most transplants move to where transplants also move, meet other people not from here and get upset that they're all fake. Mm. And that's not the real L.A. in yeah. my opinion. All my friends from here are some of the coolest people I've ever met. Mm. Yeah. I always thought it was a good practice living in New York City and dealing with the subway and sort of uh, figuring out what you were going to spend time and energy getting exasperated about, you know. <laughs> I also found the subway in New York City to be a really heartening thing because you take multiple rides a day where there are many, many multiples of people stacked on top of one another and usually nothing traumatic happens, mm. you know. Um, there are exceptions to that, but I found it to be rather, rather heartwarming, you know, like so many people like actually being basically considerate of one another, you know, and that's an experience that um, is really off-putting and, and unsavory to a lot of people that don't want to mess with going to New York City for a visit. You know? Right, right. I mean, I would say two things to that. One, I fully agree about the subway, but I also think it's, it's the subway and that experience you just described, which is why it, New York isn't as diverse as it could be. So oh, get staying this, apart. They get this this false sense of, I mingle with these people all the time. Mm. And they don't ever take a step back and be like, am I friends with any of these people? Yeah. Or do I just see them a lot? Yeah. And I think that's where true diversity comes in is when you become actual friends with the people that you're normally passing by. Yeah. Yeah. And and that, that brings me to a question that I like to ask a lot uh, to myself on the toilet and in the shower. How do we <laughs> how do we get to new groups? How do we meet one another? Where are we holding space for each other? I always have this dream about organizing town hall meetings where we find a sponsor to do like a nice free breakfast and then everybody gets to stand up and talk about their week for 10 minutes. And everybody sits and listens and just sort of holds space, right? Um, where, I mean... Kind of happens in AA maybe, but where where are we finding like small groups where people actually listen to one another and talk to people that they're not normally expecting to talk to? Where is that going on? Yeah, that's an interesting thing because I could give an answer that satiates all of that except for the last part, people we weren't expecting, right? I think even with AA, there's an expectation I'm going to meet someone else who's in the program if yeah. I go to one of these things. I'm not going to meet some physicist who's never had a drink in his life, right? Um, but I think that that's kind of the best we can do in a random sense uh, without forcing conversation upon a stranger 
Mm-hmm. Um, is find community that more closely aligns with our personality. So I do improv. Mm-hmm. And I started improv after a career in basketball. And the first takeaway I had was, this is kind of crazy that all of these people doubled down on this community so intensely. You know, it's very rarely do these people hang out with people outside of that community. I'm talking pre-pandemic. Things have changed a bit since. But, yeah. Um, rarely do they hang out with people outside this community. Rarely do they find comfort outside this community. And when that community crumbled during the pandemic, I actually saw a lot of people really struggle with, I'm so used to connecting with people in this way. Oh, you found that the improvisers were really, really uh, in a sect. Yeah, yeah they were like very dedicated incestuous. to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And and a big part of that is because they, you know, they're people who moved to this city maybe to try to be an actor. Maybe they did theater in high school. They don't feel like someone who can just go to any bar in West Hollywood and meet models or something. Right? They feel like I feel out of place here. So they find it amongst others, and that oh, place happens yeah. to be the improv stage. And I think that's as good as anybody can ask for is to to double down on what do you enjoy. I play softball too. That's a whole community. Improv, that's a whole community. Stand-up comedians, that's a whole community. Rarely do these all cross yeah. because it's kind of difficult. But if you find a community, you'll find diversity within it. Yeah. And that's the best you can hope for, I think. Yeah. How do we put a community together that's that involves like purposeful intersections like that? Where how how does how's that done? I found that individuals do that. I I have some, I've met people throughout my life that have made it their mission to bring people together. I'm actually going to uh, Cabo on the second and I had no intention of going to Cabo. I really can't afford it like that. Like the the price tag on this is enormous. Um, But it's because I have a friend I met in New York um, or I, I met in LA, but he lived in New York for a long time. His name is Nick Sonnenberg Mm. and he does these connectivity retreats with you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, New York Times bestselling authors, et cetera, like former NFL players. Like okay. I'm I'm the lowest on this list that was lucky enough to be invited to this one. Mm. And I'm using this as an example. We'll all go there mm-hmm. and there's activities for this whole week mm. designed to bring us all together yeah. and generate something more beautiful out of all of our individuality. Yeah. That is because Nick has the vision and he knows enough people. Yeah. And I've seen this a few times where people are like, I am tired of how things are. I know so many people. How about we all get together? Yeah. And I've seen that lead to new clubs. New, I'm sure that's how a lot of the organizations we know today yeah. started. Just one person who really believed that there's another way to bring people together. Yeah. But then that just becomes its own community again. And then if you weren't there yeah. when it happened, now you're looking from the outside right. eventually. Right, right. I had the pleasure of being invited into a a pre-existing community this past weekend. A friend of mine invited me to a three-day mountain music festival. Mm. Um, It's something I never would have done for myself, something I'd never done the likes of which I hadn't done anything like that before. Um, I hadn't even set up my tent in like five or six years, you Mm. know. So I was was apprehensive and nervous going into it, but um, really found this particular community to be very welcoming. It was uh, music-centered, also movement-centered, ecstatic dance and eye-gazing and... I felt I felt really nourished by that by that connection, and I think especially after the last couple of years, mm. um, you know, finding ways. Improv is a very physical and physically engaging uh, pursuit, isn't it? If you do it that way, okay. I, well, there's you know, have you ever heard the term physical comedy? Yes, is that slapstick? No, it just means like you're doing something with your body okay. to create the, you know, the funny. Okay. Uh, and some improvisers are really good at physical comedy. I don't mean that, but I mean like if if we're improvising and yeah. you you tell me I'm a chicken, yeah. well, I can I can be just a man being like bok bok or I can say nothing and just walk around like and the person who does the latter well will actually probably get a bigger response. But not everyone's really good at that. Okay. So not everyone really does the physical a lot of improv especially if you're not seeing like the best two people sit in a chair and just look at each other and just talk like we are. And they're trying to generate jokes, but it's not its not as engaging, but that's a lot of it. So I think the physical nature of it is really like a level up that not a lot of people have in their in their bag. Yeah. It's a big leap, though, to start to, to go from the sitting into the actual trying to physicalize your comedy. It's a big leap to train your mind to not respond in word, but in, in movement. Uh-huh. 
So again, I've been in scenes where probably early, the the funny thing is I have a yo-yo and I'll just talk about the yo-yo the whole time. We'll be like, and it, it'd be funny, especially when you're in improv 101, like, wow, Rod's got a yo-yo. Like, hell yeah, I have a yo-yo. You don't want to know where it is. <laughs> and it's really basic. And I think that's the type of improv that people use. are like, oh God, I hope this doesn't suck. <laughs> like, and where I am now, if you told me I have a yo-yo, you're going to see me use that yo-yo all the time. I'm mm-hmm. going to wrap it around. I'm going to do, I'm going to find ways to make my response, not words, but something to do with this yo-yo. So we got to see it. Don't talk about it. Show, Show us. Me. Yeah. How did you decide to get into uh, improv and what was what were, what were your thoughts uh, before you did it, took the leap? I had seen an improv show maybe 2017 with my buddy Brandon. And I remember afterwards, I believed that it wasn't improvised. I never seen improv, but I was like, that's not improv. Oh, you thought it was scripted? I thought for sure it was scripted. Uh-huh. I was like, they definitely wrote some of this because it was too smooth. Now, some of these things I can tell, like almost like how you watch, if you saw a magic show for the first time, you're like, I know that the trick happened, but all I want to figure out is how. Because obviously it's a trick. And I felt the same way with improv. I was like, they wrote some of this. They did this. They did that. I figured it out. I don't need to. And he's like, no, man. I, I re- we really got in an argument about it. Fast forward when I retired from basketball. I mean, like literally the next day I flew back from Korea. 2018. 2018. April 2018. And it must have been the next night. It's like 4 a.m. because we had this whole like welcome back thing. And and he and I are just sitting in my living room. He's like, I bet you want to do improv. And I was like, I'm not scared of improv. He's like, well, then sign up. And I, I just signed up right then just to just to shut him up. And then three days later, I'm in class. And now it's like such a big part of my life, but it was just a dare. And... I think a lot of the answers you'll get from me today are going to be in a similar vein where I've, I've really realized I'm starting to become like Jim Carrey and Yes Man. Like, you know, or at least the version at the end where it's like you can say no to things, but I say yes to almost yeah. anything. Yeah. If it sounds new and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I've been saying yes to everything since I moved to Los Angeles. Unfortunately, it's been revealing some really beautiful things. I'm, I'm stoked about how many things have come from just saying yes. What, what's the biggest thing for oh, you? Oh, connections with other people. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That camping expedition of this mm. past weekend, interview guests, um, conferences to be a part of, shows that I've met people at that I'm playing music with now. Um, and it took a big saying yes to the idea of coming out here, mm. leaving a familiar place and, and friends and community and family. Um, yeah, it's powerful to be able to, to say yes. Um, do you find improvisation to be therapeutic or cathartic to to an extent at all, or is it a different uh, set of uh, desires and goals? No, I'd say that the the former is more true. I think that improv. It's interesting. Lately, I've been really working on, you know, shutting down my egoic mind and being present, and. What I realized about improv, what it did for me, is it filled that gap that sports left open. Hmm. Because sports, I can be the the shittiest person. Can I curse on this? I don't know. Go for it. (laughs) I can be the shittiest person who doesn't pay attention at all, ADHD or whatever, in real life. But to be good at sports, you have to be able to focus on the moment. There is nothing else. So if I'm playing a game, I'm like a whole different person. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm really locked into what's happening. Improv is the same, maybe even more so. I can't miss a detail of what you say in a scene because mm. the scene's blown. Or if I do, then we have to try to, I have to lock it even more to find a way to make it funny. But being present is the biggest part of improv. Mm-hmm. You have to listen and you have to be right here. And I think that that improv really started me on the journey of understanding how to do that outside of improv. Not the listening part so much, but but being aware of like everything, like not mm. just what's right in front of me, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I did an exercise where I just walked into a room I'd already been in, you know, a thousand times. And I just looked around and there were so many new things I noticed because I realized I'd, I'd be somewhere and people would be like, Oh, don't you love that they have this design there? I'm like, I never seen that. Cause I never look up. I'm always just whatever I'm doing, not what's happening. What's the world around me and, and how can mm. I, exist in it better 
Okay, so taking the egoic sense of you out allows you to look without uh, what what what's what's being removed. Yeah, it's harder for me to explain, um, but I, I read you know uh, the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, yeah, yeah. and yeah, you know, it's not like it's an unpopular book, but the I what I, my takeaway from it is the more intelligent you are, especially the more active your egoic mind is, mm. and Although that really benefits someone like me, where it holds me back is especially in interpersonal relationships. And I think that it tends to give me anxiety. And I don't, depression is too far, but some version of sadness because you're just always aware of the weight of the world. Mm -hmm. And the book kind of just says if you, could shut that part of your brain off on purpose, could you? Not because you're in the middle of a basketball play or not because you're in an improv scene, but just because you wanted to. Because mm -hmm. if you can't, then your mind has control over you. Yeah. And that as a basis has led me to a lot of self-discovery in the last six, seven months. Mm. Uh, and seeing myself different and understanding how I interact with the world differently. Mm -hmm. Well, we talk about non-ordinary states of consciousness a lot in, in with regard to psychedelics in particular. Um, but I always think that uh, getting into a flow state could be through improv, could be through painting, could be through music or um, uh, basketball even. Um, you know, it's kind of like, uh, that to me feels like a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And I associate that particular state with uh, very high pleasure. Mm. Do you find, um, that you feel uh, a non-ordinary state of consciousness in whatever you endeavor to, to, to practice or be involved with? Do you get, do you get to that point with, with improv or with painting or with, were you ever getting to that point in your, um, athletics and athleticism? Yeah, it's it's funny because maybe only recently when when I started focusing on being present, then I was able to feel the joy in those things as it was happening instead of what what used to happen is I'd look back and be like, oh, that was really fun. Not like this is fun. Um, and I think the first time I noticed this was my last game as a professional basketball player, my very last game. This was game six of a seven-game series. Did you know it was going to be your last at the time? No, but there was a chance. Okay. We were down 3-2, and we lost two straight. So um, although that game did come down to a buzzer beater, we did lose. But the the before the game, knowing it might be, normally I, uh, I had a routine that with you know two minutes left, I would actually do a like a quick one-minute meditation, like literally on the call map with headphones on, like in the corner of the arena. And in this day, I didn't do it. I just looked up and I saw all the same things I had seen before. The fans were, they have these big, like glowy sticks that are like two, three feet. They're all doing this. So it looks like a wave of lights. There's like hundreds of drones. They go really over the top with the production. Drones with lights and lasers flying all around. And this particular team had the, probably the biggest pregame video presentation, like one that went, these huge sheets would drop from the, the ceiling of the arena down to the floor and they would play the video. So it's like a, 150 feet of like the other teams like highlights before the game and all of this is happening at the same time and again i'd seen it all before clocked a lot of it but in this moment i started crying because i it was the first time i appreciated it mm. i i really was sitting there I, I started crying i was like how cool was this this is so damn cool but when you're in a basketball state of mind all of that you can't pay attention to it because you're focused on the on on the thing, like rookies do that. That's how they end up rattled by other opposing fans and stuff like that. The true veteran is all of that is like nothing. It's just noise unless you want it to be. Mm. Uh, if I'm playing a home game and I do something awesome in the final second, sure I'm gonna acknowledge the crowd because it's like I know how to turn that on and off. But mm -hmm. just appreciating what it is and seeing everything at once was like a sensory overload and it was it was so beautiful hmm. but i had never once in 12 years ever done that yeah, it didn't serve you up to that point i don't even know what if it if it wouldn't have served me i just know i it, i didn't think hmm. it did and that and 
that as a tangent could take me on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. The idea of what I think serves me versus what actually will. Well, just the idea <laughs> of the athlete needing to be so dialed in and right. just focused on the task at hand as opposed to getting caught up in the ephemeral yeah. distraction of everything. Yeah. That's probably something that athletes have to adjust to after their careers are over too, like kind of that 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 myopic focus has to sort of like widen a little bit just to be able to cross the, the street safely and to be able to have all the myriad interactions that you have to do when you're not on such a tight schedule, right? Yeah. My ex used to, when we first got together, my ex used to, in the off season, be like, oh, let's take a walk. And I'd be like, <laughs> you kidding me? I'm going to take a walk. I'm tired. I don't take walks. I got to preserve my body. Like, we'll get in like, this is LA, it's hot. Or, you know, there's so many things. Yeah. Once I retired, we were taking walks all the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is, this is so much more pleasant than I thought it was, but I couldn't see it before because- as a basketball player, no, don't do anything extra. Do exactly the amount of activity you're supposed to do. Party really hard for sure. <laughs> and that's it. Mm-hmm. Do not even take a walk with your loving girlfriend. It's mm. mm. a lesson I had to learn. Are you learning lessons in th- with the help of therapy now? You said you're, you're yeah. in, in therapy now, yeah. right? Yeah. How long has that been going on? I started therapy right after I retired. Did, did someone advise you to do that or did you just feel like it was a good idea? It was just, I just had intention on that because I've seen people really struggle with retirement. Other um, a- other athletes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that therapist and I kind of had an arc, but she wasn't what I really needed. And then I found my current therapist, her name is Jeff, uh, late 20, maybe this time about two years ago. And... What's great about Jeff is because I'm I'm actually pretty introspective already and really do try to like isolate when I have like a weird feeling and stuff like that. Jeff and I really get into more high concept discussions that help me process my own thoughts. Uh, so like a lot of the questions you've asked me so far today, even the answers are really succinct because we've nailed them down quite a bit. Mm. Whereas before, I, I if I do have something new, I come to Jeff with a feeling. It's usually rather rambly. Then he kind of challenges me to, to figure out what I'm trying to say. And then we get there and it's, you know, then it's like, is this thing the right thing for me? Is it good? Am I making the, you know, the choices that I think are going to lead to the life that I want? Um, so I recommend everyone do therapy because I, 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 I think people tend to consider it to be something like, if you're broken, you're going to get fixed mm-hmm. instead of like oil every 3,000 miles, my guy. <laughs> Change your oil. That's not, that doesn't mean your car's broken. It just means maintenance is as important as anything. Mm-hmm. So maintain your mind just the same. How did you, what was your process like in finding the therapist that works for you? Because I think that's one of the things that people come up against too. It can, it can feel daunting if you've never like explored that space before. Yeah. And it was, it really was. Um, my first therapist, I found by just searching psychology today or whatever, and by proximity at that time I was living on Hollywood and Vine, a lot of therapists, especially black therapists were all in El Segundo or further. So I wasn't going to do that. So I was like, I bet any therapist will pretty much do. I, I don't, I mean, I'd never done it. So you wanted to have a black therapist at first. So I that did. Was the aspiration. I did. I did. Um, but I went with this white lady who was very, very nice. And she did help me. But at a certain point, I realized we were reaching the issues that mattered the most to me. And I was doing more explaining than listening. Because she didn't have a context in which to understand the issue. Exactly. Exactly. And so when I ended that relationship with her, this was in a fall 2019, late 2019. After seeing her for about a year? Yeah, a year, year and a half. Uh Uh-huh. at that point, I started looking, but again, there was nobody black who was close. So I, you know, I was really kind of teetering on like, do I drive an hour and a half to go see somebody, or you know, what about virtual? Was that an option? No, and that's what I'm getting to. When the pandemic hit, then all these people went virtual. It wasn't immediate, but it was probably like June, 2020. I was able to find a, a bunch of different people online, and then I actually you know, reached out to maybe eight to 10. And that weeding process led me to to Jeff. 
uh, eventually. But if it weren't for the pandemic, I might not have a therapist still hmm. because no one wants to do all this. It's weird because it's something you want to do. But I'll tell you this, you'll drive two hours for new tires. You're probably not going to do it for oil. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> no one's trying to spend that much effort on maintenance, so including me. Uh, so when that, that changed, it really opened things up. So I, I actually really think anybody who tried before and, and failed should reconsider, especially now that most of these people are doing virtual as well as in person, mm -hmm. uh, unless you just really need to be in person with somebody. For me, I found that the virtual has been just fine. Okay. And Jeff's a black man? Yes. And how did you narrow your search down? Was that easy enough, or did you were you able to find practitioners that that matched the criteria you put in place? Uh, I think maybe because it was virtual, everyone did. I, it wasn't even a process I was aware of until it was over. But they all wanted to like have like a quick chat to like see if it was a uh -huh. fit, and ours was just the best of those of those chats. Yeah, and he reminds me of a. Yeah, he could just be in my friend group, but also like my uncle, <laughs> older, <laughs> like at the same time, older in age. Not or, much older though. Uh -huh. He's like forty-two. Okay. I mean, it's not crazy. Yeah, uh, I have friends that age all over, right? Yeah. But when he's when he goes to forty-two mode, it's like okay, now we're having a like a discuss. He's telling me what I need to hear. Yeah. And other times it's like we're just peers, mm -hmm. and that's what I need sometimes too. One thing I tell people, you know, just people will say like, I don't need therapy. Like I, you know, I have a great friend group and they all listen. And I think that's super important, mm -hmm. but I don't think sometimes you realize how much you burden your friends also sure. <laughs> with your, with your issues. Yeah. So having someone who feels like a friend, but is there to be supportive. I know I'm not burdening this individual, nor am I burdening my other friends with constant saying of the same issue I might have or something. You know totally. what I mean? Yeah. What's what what's integral? I'm sure there's a lot to it, but can you elaborate on what's integral for you about having a black therapist and where that um, allows for progress in ways that maybe another practitioner couldn't facilitate? Yeah, I think that the, the first and foremost, there's an immediate understanding of many things. I, as I am on an, an improv team called Lemon Pepper Wet, it is all black men, and our first show, we must have known each other for a month. Everyone's takeaway is you guys must have known each other for years. It had nothing to do with us knowing each other. It's that without knowing each other, we all know each other. Mm. It's hard to explain, but it is, it is so clear. Uh, it's why we all, when we walk by on the street, we, we do the nod to one another, right? It's acknowledgement like, man, you still here, black man? I'm still here. <laughs> that energy directly from the therapist was palpable right away. It went from me even if my old therapist didn't need the explanation, I always felt like I did need to explain it, right? I, and, it, you know, maybe she just was being nice and listening, but I felt like I always had to explain, okay, but as, as a black person, this is how. With Jeff, it is, it is none of that. And that was, that was part one, uh, just that immediate part. Part two was, I, you know, I've been having issues with my mom, and so I brought her into my old therapist, and my mom completely overran this woman and, you know, <sighs> left cross with arms crossed saying, I'll never do this again. And all, you know, and it, that was the day I realized that she and I as a therapist were, were at our end because she'd taken me as far as she could. Mm -hmm. Jeff is also a preacher. Now he doesn't do religious based therapy with me and I'm not a particularly religious person, but he gets my mom in a way that no one else has, mm -hmm. uh, in part just being older, being black, but also being of the church, which she is, and understanding that logic sometimes that comes with that. Um, in a way only a black religious person could. It's, I would say that the more specific you are as a person, probably the more spe specificity you need in your therapist. Mm. But if you're just someone who's like, yeah, I have a job. I go to work. I drive a Prius. I maybe any therapist will do because your your issues won't be so specialized. But if you're, you know, you said you used to do mu music. Well, if you're on the the black keys or something, I don't think any musician will do. I don't any therapist will do because your issues will be 
monumental for them. Mm. I think that's why a lot of celebrities have celebrity therapists, like ones who work specifically with them, because mm -hmm. they understand the, the rigors niche. of that life, right? Yeah. I think the, when you get someone who understands your life better, it just works better. And the more specific you are, the more specific that requires. Has Jeff indicated to you that there's any kind of finite nature to what you're working on now? Or is this kind of just an open-ended thing? Like, we're going to go as long as you think you need to go? Or he's going to determine for you when you've reached a level that he thinks you can go on your own and have the most thriving life? Or what? Right. Uh, no, that hasn't happened. I mean, maybe I've just been in flux so much this whole time. But we have gone from weekly to bi-weekly. Uh, or bi-monthly, however you want to, the bi thing is weird. Every other uh, month? Or every, every other, other week? every other week. Every other week? Every yeah. other week. Um, at my request, because I realized I just didn't have that much to say sometimes. Yeah. Especially because I can be really um, succinct, especially in therapy. Like, I say the issue, and then we tackle it, and I actually am someone who really understands stuff quickly, too. So we don't need to dwell on it. Yeah. So I found that every week was just... 30 minutes in, I'd be like, so how about the Dodgers <laughs> you know, or uh, something, right? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't always and, at critical mass. And I and I hope that, you know, in a period of time, soonish, I feel that way when it's biweekly and it's just now we go once a month. Yeah. And it keeps winding down until I think that the best case scenario is call me when you need me. That would seem to indicate progress. That would seem to indicate progress, yes. And I would like to progress to that level. So far, my progress has gone from every week to twice a month. I should also note that I was in couples therapy with my ex as well. So it was like eight times a week, eight times a month for me. So it was actually getting a lot there too, because I was talking about things double time. Have you ever felt that you've been in a state of addiction? Yes. Uh, and maybe I'm still somewhat in that, in that state. Uh, just with alcohol, you know, it's, I, I think a lot of people are and don't think about it. They just think it's part of their routine or something. But I know that for me, there are times when I hate it and there are other times where I love it. And I think that that is an ass a sign of a low level addiction. I mean, mm. but I, I handle it really well also, which means it's like, you know, a lot of people when they make big change, it's because something significant happens. Like I, you know, I don't know your story, but you said this Halloween. When you said that, my, I, my, the trigger in my mind is, it must have been a crazy last Halloween then, mm. where you made a choice afterwards, like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. For me, my Halloweens are all pretty the same. They're all pretty tame, right? Like, there's no spike. So the addiction can last without any real need. Like, I went to, I had a physical with the doctor the, the other day, like last week. And he asked me how much you drink. And I told him, I was like, it's kind of a lot. I do shows a lot. I'm big. I have a super high tolerance. So it's just a lot. How many drinks does it take to get you buzzed? Buzz? I probably need like, depending on how fast it happens. Because I, I can, I, you can shock your system into feeling that. But yeah. without like just cramming it like a bottle in my throat right away, probably like six to eight shots. Wow. Just to get a buzz going. Um but so I told my doctor this and he, you know, he's like, well, does it affect you? I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, do you feel like sluggish? You feel this? And I'm like, honestly, no. He's like, yeah, not that big a deal then. Unless your numbers, well, we'll check for fatty liver, all that. All my numbers, top notch. So it's like, how do you describe an addiction that doesn't hurt yourself or anybody, right? You just know that it's there because you, when you don't do it, you're like, oh, where's that thing? Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's just that simple. Yeah. And Jeff and I have talked about this and we, you know, I've gotten a lot better, but you know, when you don't have emotional balance, it's easy to start looking back for that thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I gotten it down to like, which is good for me, but like two days a week of heavy drinking maybe. And then I did this reality show where they took away every, you know, comfort you have except liquor. So then I was just this drunken asshole what was in this, this reality what, what show. Was this, what was the show? I, don't, I didn't know about this. What were you, what were you well, it hasn't come out yet, so I can't talk about ah. it publicly here yet. But okay. it, it, the trailer will probably drop any day, and then I can talk about it. But 
Uh, it's going to come out on the 19th of October. So I, it's just you in a room with a bunch of bottles of booze around, and, and uh, you had to figure your way out. Yeah, out something like that. Something like that. Let's just say that when, when you see people be crazy on TV, it's not because they're crazy for the most part. Some oh, people yeah. just are. Yeah. But if you take away everything that makes someone a balanced person, hmm. down to like you can't go for a walk or you know can't have your phone or you can't can't turn on the air conditioning – and it's 100 degrees out in Kentucky, right? Like all those things start to make you something that you have tried so hard not to be. Oh, well, yeah. Especially as you get older. Like I think everyone's crazy. And then you learn how to like manage that and be, you know, the version that society can work with. And then yeah. you go to the situation where all of that comes undone from everybody. I mean, I'm really intrigued, but it's in a very morbid and kind of uh, <laughs> guilty way. I, I'm glad you survived it. Yeah, no, it was, again, at the end of the day, it was fine. And that's, you know, the question was addiction. And I'm like, I'm describing this thing to say, like, grabbing this big bottle of vodka and being like, well, there's nothing else to do, felt so, like such a regression. Yeah. Right? It wasn't like, there was nothing wrong with it. Nobody got yeah. hurt. I mean, I did cuss a bunch of people out, but they deserved it. And, you know, that's fine. But the reality is, I didn't want to be that thing. Yeah. And I think that's another sign when you do something, when you end up being something you don't want to be. Sure. But there's, you know, unfortunately, as long as I can keep on living, not hurting people or myself and I'm healthy, mm -hmm. it's such a hard choice to make because mm -hmm. it's not affecting anything, anything at least that I can measure. And it actually really helps me start writing, not finish writing. Okay. But, you know, you write drunk and you edit sober. So you get out of your own way and then you come back in when you're all, whoop. All focused. Do you write sober also? Yes, but I, I only do the right drunk thing when I am having trouble just starting. Like I have such a good idea where to begin. Well, that's one of the that's one of the ways that people talk about utilizing psychedelics too, especially like microdosing, coming up with a way to um, augment or jumpstart their creativity. Hmm. Um, have you utilized psychedelics in that fashion? No, and in fact, I would say I, I don't. A lot of people use marijuana for that too, and I I can't. No, those things shut my brain down. No, I do think psychedelics open my brain up over a longer period of time, but I've never gotten just high. I've only ever microdosed, so I have felt an expansion in my understanding for sure. Wait, what was the microdosing for? Why did why why did how did that how did that happen? So, the day of my breakup, which was almost a year ago. Like, let's say... Long-term relationship. Yeah, yeah, like six and a half years. Okay. Um, Do you think you were going to get married? Uh, yes and no. I mean, in any long relationship that's also problematic, you feel all the things kind of at various points. Yeah. Um, but uh, the day we broke up, I hit up a friend of mine. I hit up a bunch of friends like, who's, who's available? Like, I just want to be out. And a friend who's going to the Rufus de Soul concert at Bank of America Stadium, and um, he's like, oh, we got VIP, VIP pit, come join us. I'm like, it's like $1,000 last minute, but okay, anything to not feel what I'm feeling. And so, we, and I was tired because I had gone out the night before, because or it was like Halloween was the night before or something. It was something where it was like, it was right around that time. I don't remember the day of the show, but uh, so I was like super tired. So we, I get to this house in the hills and everyone's getting ready to go to this thing. And I'm like, do you have any Red Bull? Like, I'm just tired. And he's like, I do, but I also think you should try this instead first. Because Red Bull's bad for you. You know that, right? And I'm like, yeah, everyone knows it's bad for you, but I just, I'm just tired, man. I'm like, I don't do it often. Just give me Red Bull. He's like, and he's, it, it was this other guy in the car, too. It was just, they both have gotten into the business of psychedelics. And so they had chocolates. And he's like, try this triangle. And if you don't feel energized in the next hour, have the Red Bull. And I was like, that's fair. It's only 6 p.m. or whatever. So sure. Um, and I never asked for the Red Bull. So I first used it as like a pick me up kind of thing. Like, uh, and mind you, I never once I'd been so adverse to these things. So it was like part of it was like that I was so emotionally raw that him suggesting I was like, sure, I'll do. I'm open to anything now. Nothing. Was that matters. a self destructive feeling, or was that just? Uh... It wasn't self destructive because again, I didn't, I didn't eat the bag or whatever. I just yeah. was like, I'll try your triangle, sir. Yeah. Like what, when I probably maybe yeah a bit more reckless. Uh -huh. That same. You ever seen Twilight? Yeah. 
when Bella and Edward break up and Bella like wants to get on the motorcycles with the guys, like it's reckless, but it's also like, I can't live in the world that this other person created. I have to like create a new one kind of, it's like safe. Okay. Uh, and doing shrooms that day, even on a micro dosing version felt like a rejection of my relationship or something. Okay. It felt, like emotionally, it felt like changing the paradigm. Yeah. And so I did it. And again, I just never, the night wasn't crazy by any means. Not like I tripped out or anything, but I just never asked for the Red Bull. You got energized? I did. I did. And I really didn't understand how it worked, but I understood like, okay, well, this does this thing for me. Uh -huh. So then like a month later, as it goes, Rufus DeSoul was playing in a, in Vail as part of a music festival that, um, a bunch of friends of mine were throwing, so I was like, I'll go to this music festival. I mean, it wasn't just Rufus Soul, it was a bunch of people that I know, including my like college girlfriend was on the ticket. Um, but so we go to Aspen first for a few days and then we go to, to Vail for the festival. And again, I'm just tired. So I like asked my one of my boys there, like, do you have any like shrooms like in microdose? Like, and he hands me like a bag of gummies or whatever. And I would just take one before going out every night instead of a Red Bull. Did you have an idea of what microdose meant to you? I mean, I, I would assume that it meant you didn't want to have a trip, but you wanted to have some feeling of a psychedelic working in you. I didn't care for the psychedelic feeling. I mean, now that I had done it, it was like, maybe one day I will go full out on this, but it was strictly because this is a more natural way for me to feel energy instead of resorting to Red Bull. Because, I mean, again, before then, it didn't really matter. But after my breakup, I was going out a lot. I was just drunk a lot. So it was like I was tired, but I didn't want to be home. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like I was trying to fill a void. Was the basically. booze giving you energy? The booze was giving me energy. The booze takes away the energy. That's what I was saying. It was like, it's like the people who, like, do Adderall and drink at the same time, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. just look. It was treating it like it was an Adderall. Mm -hmm. And so that was like that festival and then random times in December. And, and, and it's weird because I kept just using it like that, but more sporadic. Cause there wasn't like a big focus as I started to settle down. But then I went to, to England in uh, April. And on that trip, I probably had one every morning, a bit of chocolate. Yeah. And I was in England for what, like 10 days. And then I went to Stockholm for four and for whatever reason, I started just feeling different. I, I remember being like, I just spent an incredible week. I went to the, the, the Champions League semis. I got a ticket at the last minute. Like people who understand how that is, yeah. it's like impossible. It's yeah. not like here where you can pay any amount and get a ticket. Like yeah. they have weird, strict rules about how this ticketing uh, goes. Like it has to have your name on it, all, all these things. I did stuff like that, amazing things, and I didn't feel as I was leaving England that I was happier. And it felt like I had this clarity of like, where is happiness? If this isn't it, if I can't have an amazing trip to England and leave feeling like I like with joy, what am I missing? And that's when I actually opened up the the Tolly book on the train from Piccadilly to Heathrow, uh, and I started crying within five minutes of reading it. And then I went to Stockholm and I, you know, still microdosing every day, but not for energy anymore. I started to feel like, I don't know if this is placebo or not, but I feel like I'm having some sort of awakening because mm -hmm. I, you know, and it, it took what, two or three months of me doing it more sporadically, but I was like, I don't feel like I used to feel something has changed and I cannot quantify it. And then I kind of ran out of them. Right? I only had so many. Then the summer kind of hit and I went and did this this show where I couldn't take any of that with me. Uh, they even confiscated my like fish oils. Like, <laughs> right? So I'm saying nothing that helps you, they want, they want you to bring in. But and I started up again after. And again, if I, get, I don't know what the science is supposed to be. But then it's like three, four weeks after I started doing it again, I'm like, I have this like new clarity of like, oh, I need to make these choices. I need to do these things. And again, I don't know if it's placebo or not because I'm doing a lot of things at once that I think are going to better my life. But I know this, it feels like there's no going back and that microdosing has had something to do with that. Mm. And I don't know what. 
but I'm going to continue to do it. It's still a part of your life now. Had had a gummy before I came in today. Again, not as a Red Bull, just as a like the same way I take all my vitamins. You can see it as a supplement. Yes. Yeah. So the term plant medicine you think applies in this instance? Uh, I don't. I don't know what that term means. People refer to psychedelics often as plant medicine hmm. um, when they're talking about uh, sacred substances and um, things that need to be treated with reverence and understood in a different way, other than a traditional drug or illicit drug or recreational drug. Right. I'm glad it's had positive effect for you, and I hope that it continues to. Um, We've obliterated our time, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, but I w did want to point out before we jet that we've had your work back here on the screen the whole time. And it's beautiful work. And people can check it out at your website, robbensonart.com. Rod with a D. Rod Benson Art. Yeah. I keep saying Rob, too. Everyone does it. It's a weird it's thing. With the B is right there. It's just yeah, yeah. impinging upon the D. <laughs> um Thanks so much for speaking with me with such candor and openness, you know, because I always I always want us to be able to discuss uh, the the trickiness of what makes us who we are, mm. you know, um, and be able to peel back the layers and, and get at, you know, um, oh, it's the things that feel a little bit more awkward to share, things that feel a little bit more, um, like you said, you can't always burden your friends right. with some of the, 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 the sticky nuance, but but we can burden our podcast audience with that information. <laughs> and, and, and obviously the hope is that if somebody hears something that like inspires them or kind of gets them thinking about themselves, right? What's the big, uh, what, what, what would you leave anyone listening to this podcast with right now? Just something to consider or something that inspires you or some... Um, some suggestion for, for, for wellness or something you've learned that you'd like to impart? Do you have, feel like blessing us with a little last bit of, uh, of optimism or, 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 uh, or pessimism, <laughs> whatever is in your mind? No, I'm currently quite optimistic. And I'll say a big part of that is there are so many things in life that we think aren't for us or that don't apply or, or whatever. And I found that sometimes when I've leaned into those things, it's opened up so much more. Mm. So if anything, I'd say you don't know what you like. You don't know who you are until you try it all. So don't be afraid to take that leap. Like you said, being a yes man has helped you. It's helped me. And part of that yes for me is, yes, it's been psychedelics a little bit. And I think that so many things have come in my life since I've been open. And I just wish everyone has that the bravery to be open. Rod, thanks for your time, man. Thank you. Let's do it again. Indeed. Cool. <laughs>